Today we have a very distinguished panel of uh, folks who have been working on many of the same issues uh, that confront the U.S.-Mexico border region. Um, we have, uh, for those of us who live here in the border region, we understand that um, particularly in the San Diego Tijuana region, which is really the capital, I like to say, of the border region and the center of the universe because it's where the global north meets the global south. It's along the Pacific Rim where east meets west in our maquiladoras. We have, uh, I think, a really good handle on what are some of the challenges uh, and the opportunities that globalization presents here along the border. And we have a fantastic group to talk with us uh, here today. I'd like to introduce our, our panelists. Uh, we're joined first and foremost uh, by uh, the former mayor of Ciudad Juarez, uh, Jose Reyes Feris, who's going to uh, join us up on stage here. Also by uh, Ana Gabriela Perez, the social innovation manager from Urbi Desarrollo Urbano. And uh, by Elisa Sabatini, Executive Director of VIA International. Uh, could we have a brief round of applause for our panelists? The, the U.S.-Mexico border region is, I think, a very poorly understood place. So we have an opportunity to set the record straight here about how the border region works and, and what are some of the, uh, the, the, the bright spots we're seeing here along the border. Um, this is a region that is responsible for $300 billion in cross-border trade each year uh, as part of, of Na NAFTA in North America. This is a region that's home to 14 million very hard-working uh, and, and, and entrepreneurial people who uh, have made the border region uh, what it is today. Uh, and yet, we often hear a lot about the negative. We hear about uh, the violence, and we hear about undocumented immigration. Uh, today, I hope we, we can uh, move past that and think about um, what are the opportunities that we see along the border region to reduce poverty. And uh, especially, I mean, we hear a lot about the phenomenon of the ninis, los que ni estudian ni trabajan, those who neither study nor work uh, in Mexico, and particularly along the border, who have been caught up in some of the gang violence, et cetera. Uh, the work that you all are doing or have done uh, over the last few years is so important to resolving some of that uh, some of that violence and some of the um, uh, economic difficulties that we've faced along the border. So I want to just go down the line and ask each of you a few questions. Um, First of all, uh, Mayor Fidis, you, you just left office uh, in, in sept September uh, in Ciudad Juarez, what has been described by many as the most violent city in, in uh, Mexico, where there are very significant problems uh, recently because of the uh, declining uh, presence or the declining job opportunities in the maquiladora sector. What were some of the things that you tried to do during your term uh, to help address the issue of poverty along the border? What programs and policies did you find to be most effective in helping to create economic opportunities in Ciudad Juarez? Well, you know, uh, Juarez is an interesting city because in, in Mexico it is uh, just like Tijuana, and, and of course I would dispute the uh, uh, saying that San Diego and Tijuana are the <laughs> top border city, but uh, we're not here to discuss that. <laughs> you, you know, having a city that has economic growth as strong as Juarez or Tijuana or the cities in, in Tamaulipas can lead to a very interesting development investigation as to how to solve the poverty problem. And uh, the, the poverty problem, of course, gets solved with economic development. All of our border cities for many, many years have had full employment. They've grown tremendously. The rates of growth have been over 8% a year. Uh, the, so economically, it is a very viable area of, uh, of Mexico and along the Mexico-US border. But in order to solve the problems that, that we have, uh, one of the things that we discovered was that giving employment, f having full employment and having mother, father, older brothers work uh, did not create enough uh, opportunities for growth for the kids that were left in schools. 
and uh, we partnered with many companies, including Urbi and, and uh, uh, a very good company in Mexico, very socially responsible company, and created about 150 daycare systems uh, throughout the border because there's no daycare uh, in Mexico beyond four years. Uh, you, you have government subsidized daycare from four months to four years, uh, but the formative years in Mexico go on to 10, 12 years, and there's no daycare for, for the kids. So we did that. The other thing is that when you have full employment, you have something where kids in Mexico can work uh, when they reach 16 without their parents' permission. They can work when they reach 14 if they have their parents' permission. And so guess what? You have full employment, kid gets to 14, he's off to work. Juarez is the city with the largest dropout rate in junior high school in the country. And uh, it's the city with the lowest rate of students in high school. And uh, that lack of opportunities in education, opportunities in uh, higher type of uh, work is, is something that is uh, affecting uh, the kids and, uh, or the, the youngsters in, in the city. So we made a tremendous effort to try and keep the kids in junior high subsidizing uh, from uniforms. Uh, we, we created uh, some, some parents said, well, I'm scared of my daughter going to high school uh, because there's not as many high schools, so we have to bus uh, kids to high schools. And of course, with the violence and the killings of women and other issues, uh, many mothers were very scared of their daughters going to night high school because we have to do that. We don't have enough high schools. Uh, so we created a free transportation system for junior high and high school kids so that they could go to high school and, and keep on maintaining their education. And, and one of the things that I think it's worth studying, and I think uh, I would like them to be invited to the uh, 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 United Nations uh, program at uh, Arizona, University of Arizona, uh, we created uh, high school for underprivileged kids that, ha that are top-notch students. It's a, uh, it's, it's a free school for high school for kids that are underprivileged. Uh, it, it, it was created by my administration nine years ago. In nine years, it has become the fourth best high school in the country, including private high schools. Uh, it's called Preparatoria Central. They have one of the most beautiful campuses in, in the country. It's free and it's, uh, it's for underprivileged kids. You have to work education, tremendously work education, keep the students in uh, uh, high school and, and, and junior high, and, uh, but most of all, be able to keep and, and give a good education to the younger four to 12 year olds. I'll never forget, uh, we met for the first time on February 3rd, 2010, a few days after the Colonia Salvarcar massacre where 13 uh, young people and two adults were killed in a, a middle-class neighborhood in Ciudad Juarez. Um, and in the wake of that terrible incident, um, Juarez and, and the national government, the state government, came together to form a new program called um, Todos Somos Juarez. We're all Juarez. And, and can you speak just uh, for a few minutes about how that pr uh, program, which started during your administration, has progressed? Is that helping to make a difference in, in uh, creating opportunities outside of a life of crime and violence for young people in your city? It, it will. You know, it, it's something that uh, when we first encountered the problem in, in Juarez, security problem, we went to the people who had already been through this whole thing, and, and it was Colombia. And so we went to, to Medellin, we went to Bogota, we started to learn from them, and one of the things we learned from them is that they create areas of opportunity for those that are most underprivileged. And, uh, and, and so we went to the uh, uh, Inter-American Development Bank uh, who did the Plan Colombia, uh, we asked them to do a Plan Juarez, and we created uh, this whole Plan Juarez, who we then presented to the, the federal government in Mexico. Uh, President Calderon took the plan and, and 
make it made it a lot larger than uh, we had initially proposed. He put a lot of money into it, about $30 million just in, in Juarez. And one of the important things that they did was we did a study, and we had done this before, of youth violence in Juarez. And Juarez is a city, uh, roughly 1.3 million inhabitants. Half of the population is east of the railroad tracks. Half of the population is west of the railroad tracks. And we saw all the violence was west of the railroad tracks. And then when we put the high schools on the map, all of the high schools except for one are east of the railroad tracks. And so uh, you could see very clearly that the areas where there's no high schools, no opportunities, that's the areas where the violence develops uh, most. And uh, it, it's incredible that a city of 1.3 million has one high school for 600,000 population. It, it's something that shouldn't be done. And, uh, and so we convinced the federal government to uh, build, uh, we're in the process of uh, finishing the building of uh, five new high schools on the west side of the uh, uh, railroad tracks. That is going to bring the opportunities. We're going to see the benefits in the future. We, unfortunately, it, it, it doesn't happen overnight. It, it takes a while to, to do it, but I think Todos Somos Juarez uh, is, is going to be a successful program and, and it's going to be replicated throughout the country. And, and lastly, um, we're, we're here with some of the brightest and most socially conscious uh, young minds of, of today and, and tomorrow. Uh, wh what are the opportunities for students and for academic programs and extracurricular programs to play a part in this? Uh, how do you work with local universities and students to, to uh, implement some of these programs? You know, I think it's uh, so important. Uh, uh, what Jennifer is, is doing with the uh, Thunderbird uh, in, in educating women is very important. And, and, I, and I would suggest to Jennifer and, and all of you that education is, is the top thing. And, and what can you educate uh, people in Mexico for? The best thing, educate them to learn English. Maquiladora jobs, they're well paid. Uh, and, uh, you know, somebody in, in a border city like Juarez usually makes uh, minimum wage is $5 a day, usually make three times minimum wage, uh, seven days, even though they don't work seven days. So it comes up to about, uh, I'll say, $350, $400 a, uh, a week. Uh, but everybody works you know, mother, father, kids work. So at, at the end of the day, a family has a good size income in, in, in Juarez. And uh, the jobs are manufacturing. But if you know English, you automatically make three times as much as in manufacturing. And uh, just like in the US, you have nurses wanted $56,000 a, a year, $5,000 sign-up bonus uh, because there's a lack of uh, uh, nurses in the United States. In Juarez, you'll see in every factory, English-speaking uh, personnel wanted three times the salary, 5,000 peso sign-up uh, bonus. People want to learn English. English will benefit them economically tremendously, and it opens uh, so many doors. Uh, the internet is such a, uh, a source of knowledge, and, and knowing English is, uh, opens up that source of knowledge. So w one of the things that I think you need to stress, uh, Jennifer, and, and your is just teaching them English. Is, uh, and, and you don't need to go to Mexico to do it. You know, you can, you can do DVD programs, you can do uh, internet programs to teach English, and it's so expensive to, to go to an English class in Mexico that if you can do a free class so that people can, can go in and, and get uh, their education, that would be such a, a great benefit for everybody. Thank you very much, Mayor Reyes. Uh, Staying on this theme of student engagement, student participation, one of, the, uh, one of our panelists, Anna Gabriela, was a leader during her time 
at the University of San Diego in uh, community engagement, particularly cross-border community engagement. She's now the social innovation manager for Urbi Desarrollos Urbanos and um, has a, a, a very robust program uh, working in uh, the, the Valle San Pedro to try to develop a new and innovative and, and sustainable kind of urban uh, development in, in Mexico. Um, what, what, Anna, from your perspective, as someone who has gotten involved in social issues from uh, your time at, at our great university, the University of San Diego, um, th what, um, what kind of uh, efforts and opportunities are, th what kinds of efforts are there by students that you've seen that have been successful? What are the ways that students can get involved? I think there's always this perception that I have to wait to make a contribution until after I graduate. Um, wh what got you involved and um, what, what is the potential for student involvement in a lot of these issues? Good morning, everyone. Um, I think it is very important to get involved while you're in university and I'm sure that all of you here are here right now because you're involved. I studied sociology at the University of San Diego and for me that career in itself has a lot of involvement. I was in the migrant outreach program uh, in a lot of classes I would go to study abroad. I went to Guatemala for one of my classes where I met Elisa Sabatini. After I came back um, I did my internship with her nonprofit and it just opened so many doors. The networking being in a university is something that doesn't compare if you wait after you graduate. It's something that you start while you're in the university. I think part of the success that I'm having right now after graduation has to do with all of the networking that I did while I was in the university. Right now, these opportunities that you're having are the ones that open doors for future. And it's every moment that you take advantage, a teacher, um, some of the teachers that I had in sociology at USD, I still talk to them, I still email them and tell them about what I'm doing, if they are interested, if they know other people. And I think university campuses are brilliant places for ideas to flourish. And they're places where you can get others who have more talent than you to help you out and get your ideas straight. Sometimes you have an idea and you think you can do something with it, but you just need that push that can get you to the actual labor force. And so that's one of the things that I really recommend all of you being here to take advantage of these opportunities, to take advantage of one another, of the ideas that you have. Right now we were just listening to, to the student commitments and in that second I was like, I need to speak to her and her and her <laughs> because I know they're gonna help me with what I'm doing right now. So that's a great opportunity to take advantage from. And, and where do you need help? What, what are some of the challenges that you've uh, experienced trying to alleviate the pov problem of poverty, uh, particularly in Tijuana? What are, what are the obstacles? Why is this so hard? Well, just for a background, I was born in Mexicali, which is a border city in Baja California. So for me, the border issues are not really an issue, they're a reality. There's something that I saw every day. I crossed the border since I was in first grade until I graduated high school and I came to San Diego to live. So for me, it was something that was happening every day. Seeing people in the border, seeing people some mornings cross the border <laughs> while I was doing line in my car and I was like, oh, there goes somebody. So it was something, it was a reality for me. And one of the challenges that I had when I graduated was the fact that you get into the labor force, and that's something that might happen to most of you. You have people or colleagues who have more advantage in years in experience in the topic, and in my case, in the low-income housing industry. I was new at it. I've been hearing for it for a long time, but I was new at it. And so you have people who have much more experience than you. My lack of experience, I had book knowledge. I had college experience but not real labor force experience. So what, how can you take advantage of that? One of the best things about that is that you have a fresh mind. When you get to a labor force, there are a lot of people who are really good at telling you, no, 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 no. <laughs> you can't do that or your idea sounds, no, if you get into the 
judicial part of it, no, you can't do that. Or they start telling you no, or why not? And so one of the things that I, I graduated in 09, so I'm recent at this, um, I always look at it as, no, why we can do this? Why there's a yes to most of the things? Because that's what they're telling us right now. And I think that's something you should keep with you. The yes, 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 or at least until you can, because maybe there's a point in your job where you're going to get tired of hearing no and you're going to start saying it too. But right now, it's all about innovation. And for the poverty issues, I think that's really important because it's an issue that consumes us so much, that tires people after many years of working on it, that they start telling you, well, after a while in a community and they didn't participate, and I tried doing this program, but it didn't work out just like I planned. So people start getting tired of some of these things and they tell you, no, don't try that or don't do that. And in my mind right now, I'm in a whole new spot where I say, no, I did it in college and I think I can do it. And these people, you didn't try it this way. So it's very important to try to be fresh in your mind. And mostly in this, in poverty related issues, they're complex and they revolve around many other things. They revolve about family, economics, transportation, housing, they're complex issues. So they require fresh minds like ours right now. And, and lastly, in, in your work specifically with the uh, Valle San Pedro pro project, what, what have you learned about community development along the border? What are, what are some of the lessons that we can take away from your experience with this project? And can well, you describe a little mm -hmm. bit what, what you're doing? Okay, so Valle San Pedro is a very ambitious project. It's, a, it's not only a housing project. Um, Urbi, the company that I work for, dedicates itself to doing low-income housing development projects, mostly. It's one of the biggest housing c um, companies in Mexico. And right now, one of its biggest projects is called Valle San Pedro. It lies between Tijuana and Tecate, which is actually really near from here. And it's not only about a housing project, it's about creating a whole new city. We're planning a city for half a million people by 2030. A city that should include housing, transportation, jobs, uh, the social part of it. It revolves around everything and we're also naming it the first sustainable city in Mexico and in Latin America in all of its complex. So you can realize that this is not only about a housing company, this is, includes the three levels of government, this includes the nonprofit, the public, the private sector, it includes a lot of actors that are working on it. My specific play into this is the social aspect. We don't want to repeat what we have been doing for a lot of time. We always thought that people needed houses, needed four actual roofs, and that would give them something to look after, a prestige or a status in, the, in their community. They would have streets, they would have light, they would have water, but now we realize that's not enough. People need more. One of the particular things now that we're talking about the border is that migration is inevitable. We can't stop it. And in particular in this area, Tijuana, Juarez, we get people from all over Mexico and Latin America. People who leave behind their families, who have the courage to just move. It's a perilous way to here. And they do it because they want better opportunities, better jobs for their families. They're just looking for a better life. So we get two stories. <laughs> One, when that migrant gets here, he can either receive the, he moves from a city where the rules and regulations were probably bad because that's why he didn't have job opportunities, so he had to move. He gets to a city and if the street gives them the job, it doesn't take more than five minutes for them to learn more vicious rules. And so you get a cycle of more violence, more injustice, and more marginalization. But if that migrant gets to a city where the organized society gives them that job, then you can actually have someone willing, courageous, 
with a lot of energy to work, because that's how our people get here, with energy to work, who can be doing, who can be transforming a city with more values, more education, with more sense of entrepreneurship, and a sense of ownership, but it's something that we don't have. And some people say, no, it's because these immigrants come here and then they throw trash, and then it's not true. I was working with migrants here in San Diego, and these people in less than a year or a year, they were learning English. They were abiding by every rule that you have and more because they wanted to be completely invisible. And so it's not about the people. It's about the society that receives these people. Your society had better rules than maybe our street rules. And that changes the way that they think, the way that they behave immediately. It doesn't take more than two days for them to read signs, ask around, and start doing their job correctly. So that's what we want in Valle San Pedro. We want to stop those immigrants from crossing the border. Stay here, stay in Mexico. But we're gonna receive them with an organized society. A society where right now, there's, we, have, we still have an uninhabited piece of land. Our first residents are barely coming in. And we have this opportunity. I don't know if you heard of Paul Romer. He's a professor from Stanford University, an <laughs> economics professor. And he has this thesis about charter cities. And that's how we're basing our Valle San Pedro project. He says, you have to have an uninhabited piece of land, better rules and regulations than what you have before, but before the residents, the companies, and the investors get there. Why? Because if you try to change the rules after the people are already there, you're gonna be dealing with bureaucracy, you're gonna be dealing with, with a government that won't change rules, or with people unwilling to change rules. If I go to a place right now in Mexicali and say, right now we're gonna start charging for tickets for throwing trash, $300. A revolution's gonna start because people are gonna be unwilling to obey by that. But if people opt to move to a place, knowing that there are rules, different rules, and that you have to play by different rules, but you're gonna get a better benefit in the while for your children, then that's different. You're not forcing anyone to move to Valle San Pedro. It's an option to move to Valle San Pedro. But it's a place where we're working really hard to get all of the other players in place, to get the jobs there, to get the infrastructure there. I'm working really hard right now to get the rules in place, so that the social rules in place, so that when people get there, we receive them in an organized manner. But it's a bottom-up approach. We're trying to work with the first residents so that together we can make the projects, so that they can have a sense of ownership of that land. Something that doesn't happen in Tijuana or in Juarez very often. You can ask someone after 10 years of living in Tijuana or Juarez, so where are you from? And they will tell you, Michoacán, Oaxaca, or somebody else, even after 15, 20 years. And I think that's something that we need for them to have, a sense of ownership, a sense of pride of where they live. And that's what we're working right now very hard. And that's what I'm inviting everyone right now. This is a project, Valle San Pedro is a project that it's starting. It has been for seven years working hard, but we have from here till the next 50 years to create the first real city from scratch in Mexico with new opportunities. If any of you are interested, please join us. <laughs> this is a real big challenge. Thank you, Anna Gabriel Perez. Uh, one of the people who has sustained their work for uh, 36 years, uh, working here along the border, working in social development issues, uh, is Elisa Sabatini, and she's managed to do that for 36 years without becoming one of the people who says no. Um, <laughs> she she uh, uh, has uh, recently gone through an organizational change from Los Niños to Via International. Uh, they do uh, a, a wide variety of work from family health to microcredit lending to uh, 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 nutrition. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit, um, Elisa, about the, the, what you've seen, uh, particularly over the last 36 years of, of working in this cross-border community? What has changed? What, has, uh, what, what progress have, have we seen towards uh, addressing the problem of poverty? And, and really, one of the things we haven't mentioned is the problem of inequality, because it's not just the, the problem of poverty, but it's the fact that we live uh, along the most economically divided border in the world. Uh, so what changes have you seen? 
Well, I'm, I also share Anna's enthusiasm for um, integrated approaches. I think also the mayor had mentioned that you can't just solve one thing. And um, our organization has actually designed what we think is something that supports the social fabric of the communities. And this social fabric, which Ana is, is, is launching in Valle San Pedro, is intended to capture, or maybe just re, re, recapture, you might say, some of the cultural aspects of Mexico, which are strong families, which are strong social networks, which are strong commitments to one another. And so instead of the woman that comes from Michoacan living isolated in a little house, not knowing her neighbors because they came from Oaxaca or they came from somewhere else, this, this community development approach that we have taken, frankly, 36 years to develop and um, is something that integrates the various needs that are presented by the people. And I think that um, if I were saying, what, what can you do, I would say, listen. Listen to the people themselves. You know, listen to their, it's very difficult when you're in a system, as both of, both of you spoke about, that has its certain rules, it has regulations, it has ways of, of um, operating that are the, 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 the laws, if you will. But there's another whole social law, another whole social fabric underneath all of it that's operating. And if you're attentive, you see it and you, you can work with it. Our programs cover a realm of initiatives. We have nutrition and um, ecology programming that are actually programs that are taught by women in and of those communities. We have microfinance programs that are intended to start small, small kind of home-based types of jobs for people that we hope will not have to go out to a factory, that potentially they can stay home and attend better to these issues that are for children and youth. Um, and then we have a higher education program that we think actually this year with USD, we made an application um, related to these ninis, the, the, the ones that don't study and don't work. And the idea that with a little bit of higher education or a little bit of more formal entry into some other opportunity, we can avoid some of the, the, the kind of social problems that are factors of that, that, that fabric of community. And, and can you talk a little bit more about the, the specific outreach you do? You, you started working, for example, with Ana Gabriela when she was a student. Mm -hmm. what, what specific kinds of outreach uh, or really opportunities do you have to work with Via International for, for, for students? Well, we have, a, we have very interesting opportunities in kind of two ways. Um, one would be we run a program called Volunteers. And the Volunteers program is a social business. We host upward of a thousand plus students a year in various locations. That includes the border region here, in, um, including San Diego and Tijuana and Mexicali. We also work in Guatemala and we work in, with uh, native communities in New Mexico. And all of those are opportunities for students to work side by side with people in these grassroots community development uh, processes and learn about those processes. But for longer term and actually what I consider really significant work for students, small nonprofit organizations often have no capacity to tell their story, to document what they're doing, to have student possibilities of these cross-cultural engagements. I too was making a list of the programs over here at the table um, to see you know, how we could maybe partner. I think alliances what Ana Gabriela was saying about make your networks now, start reaching out, create alliances, work with various organizations. Um, these are the kinds of things that I would encourage, particularly students such as yourselves who have already come with commitments, but to um, consider. Um, Ana Gabriela came to me after our trip to Guatemala and she said, she said, well, could I do an internship here? And um, I, sa I said, fine, but really she invented it herself. I mean, she, she came in not through a, a sort of organized program, but through a process of learning. And um, we are working very closely on, on some of this social design work for the, for the new city. So I think it's this kind of thing that students can do just by your own volition, just by, but just by your own desire to be engaged. 
And um, I know that all of you are here because of that commitment, so. And let's give them a chance to get engaged in this discussion. Um, we have a, a few minutes for question and discussion. Um, I don't know if there are microphones circul circulating around or if I need to jump out there. Um, there's, there's a question right up here uh, in the front table. Thank you. Um, we're with the Arizona Model United Nations. I mean, you guys have been really discussing one of those central issues in the board. You know that decreasing social capital and the ability to, in, to not be able to engage across the border, um, especially with the things going on in violence. I know one of the difficulties that our organization has faced, and repeatedly from our university administration, they tell us, why are you going to Mexico? Why are you going to Mexico? It's really, really violent. You know, that road down to Hermosillo, why are you going to go down there? Um, and I even had one of our faculty advisors telling us, do you still want to continue doing your project in Mexico? So I was wondering if we could get the panel's opinion on how to counteract that. I mean, what kind of policies does Mexico need to institute to start bringing more people across the border? Or what sort of things we need to do to just make sure that that engagement continues happening? Any thoughts from the panel? Well, since we deal with this pretty consistently, because um, we actually went from hosting 100 different groups of students a year, now we're hosting about maybe as many groups, but many of them are now going to Guatemala and going to the other locations. So how have we dealt with that? One of the things is to have really good documentation of what you're doing. Um, Certainly uh, some testimonials from important key people. I know we have letters from, for instance, the U.S. Consulate in Tijuana has offered us letters to say we believe that these kinds of activities are perfectly safe. And we also have worked very close with administration from the various universities <coughs> that, and actually deal with their risk managers. And in that, in that vein, you can also often get a in fact, we have a group coming back tomorrow from San Diego State University who are in Mexicali, and they got a waiver to be able to go. So a lot of it is being persistent, and then a lot of it is, is, is having good information. I also, just as a, as a point, I um, had one of the professors did some research on the statistics for Mexicali, Mexico. And it turns out that Mexicali, a city of a a little over a million, has the same uh, violence rate as Kansas City, Missouri. And, you know, no one's not saying, don't go to Kansas City. So I think that, you know, it's having, it's kind of arming yourself with these kinds of things. <clears throat> I also think that the use of, of, of uh, social networking kinds of things can be really helpful. Um, if you are prohibited, many schools are prohibited. We've set up border, border um, experiences where the students stay here in San Diego, but they actually communicate through, we do some Skyping and some other things with the communities that they were intending to, to, to go visit and serve so that, that the, the communication remains. Mayor Reyes, I think you wanted to jump yeah, in. That, that, I think we, uh, you know, as, as people in government, we tend to say, oh, now come, there's no problem. We, you have to realize that the circumstances are not the same as they were five years ago. Things are different, and, and it requires a different mindset and, and a different organizational structure to do the things you were doing before. Uh, you have to be careful, and, and the, the situations, you have to monitor the situations. Uh, situations are not the same in Querétaro, uh, a very beautiful city, safe city, uh, as they are in Juarez. It, it's very clear. Uh, even along the border, situation's not the same in, in Tijuana uh, as, as it is in, in Juarez. It's, uh, and, and it wasn't uh, five years ago, you, Tijuana was the, the bad one and then Juarez was the, the nice one. You know, it, it's, uh, it, we, you have to work to try and solve this, uh, and the governments are doing that, uh, but Anybody doing work in Mexico needs to monitor and needs to uh, be able to see what they're doing and work with the government. And the government uh, will be very glad to help you and, and provide that additional security that if you are going to Juarez, uh, that uh, 
the peace of mind of U.S. visitors and the government itself uh, taking care of visitors uh, requires. And, you know, it does not. It doesn't mean they'll put you in uh, uh, bulletproof cars. You know, it just means that uh, they'll say, "Okay, we want you to go this way and and go to this place, and we'll keep a good eye on you so that uh, things are are going fine and there's no." problem for you and no problem for for cities that are facing a problem it it's a real problem it's not it's not something that's invented by the press and and uh, over dimensioned it, it is a real problem and requires uh, special provisions but other than that uh, you can work with uh, with the areas uh, let's take a, another question uh, whoever can Oh, um, Mayor Reyes, you talked earlier about providing opportunities such as um, high schools in certain areas in order to decrease violence and crime in cities. Well, once these students go to high school and finish, what type of opportunities are there post other than going back to the Maquilas? You know, the, the, the Maquila system is, is a very interesting system. and, and uh, uh, we are very enthusiastic about the model. We, we haven't lost the enthusiasm about the model of the maquiladora uh, industry in, in along the border. For those of you that are not very familiar with it, uh, it started with the automobile industry. And uh, uh, for instance, even though we don't do automobiles in Juarez, every seat, every connection uh, to the windows that open uh, electronically, uh, the radios, uh, everything is manufactured in Juarez. For at one point, about 80% of televisions uh, sold in North America were manufactured in Juarez. Uh, and the reason that is made, and the reason it is important for a country like the United States is that the design, the administration uh, is maintained in the United States while part of the production goes to Mexico. Not all of it goes to Mexico, and, and it's, uh, it's different than manufacturing in Southeast Asia or China, where everything goes to China. Uh, in, in Mexico, we view ourselves as a partner to the United States, where part of the work gets done in the US, part of the work gets done in Mexico, and not all of the jobs go to, to places like, uh, like China. So, so we like the model. Uh, it has its problem, and, and that's what we've been talking a lot about, uh, about the problems. But uh, we've gone from 40 years ago when we began doing televisions in, in Juarez. The reason we, we did televisions in Juarez was televisions had light bulbs, and, and none of you know what that is, but uh, you know, a, a processor, uh, which is now this big, used to be a board this big that had light bulbs on it, and, and that's how a television used to work, and somebody had to put it together, and they had to weld it by hand uh, instead of a printed circuit board that you have right now and connect each one. And so they decided that Mexican women would be cheap enough labor, and, w and women, because they would be to find touch enough to do that type of work, that's what RCA started uh, the Maquilas in 1968 in, in Ciudad Juarez. That, from that, we have gone tremendously uh, to another place. We have the largest design center for automobiles in Juarez, Delphi, uh, uh, General Motors subsidiary, uh, has a company that hires engineers from all over the world, not just from, from Juarez or from Mexico, from India, from Brazil, from other countries. They go to Juarez to design automobiles, of course from the United States, uh, in their design center. Uh, we have robotics, we have so many other things, and we do it in partnership with the United States. So, uh, you know, what we want is for them to go to high school, for them to go to college, and for them to go to better jobs in uh, in Juarez and not just manufacturing jobs, uh, which is what you get when you don't have a, uh, a junior high or a high school education. 
Let's take a, a handful of questions. We're down to the last five minutes or so here. So let's just grab three questions from the audience, if we could, and we'll try to get real quick responses. Uh, this young, young man in the front uh, had gotten in the last round, and then we'll grab a couple more. We don't want to discriminate against the Western portion. <laughs> Uh, Mayor Regis, uh, my name is William, I am from Colombia, and one of my big dreams uh, since I was nine, uh, because I grew up seeing poverty from uh, first, first hand, um, has been to, to prepare myself throughout my life to be at some point ready to run for mayor of my city. So it's a great honor to, to be uh, here in the front uh, and seeing you face to face. Um, and not just seeing you, but actually hearing the holistic approach that you have given to Ciudad Juarez, to Juarez. My question would be, how does security plays a role in, in, in the holistic approach that you gave to Juarez? And we'll take just a couple more questions, and then we'll give three second answers. <laughs> My question is specific to Juarez, but if the other two panelists can voice as well. Um, I would like to know what has been done in Juarez to protect women. In the 90s, there, were, there was extreme violence against women in Juarez. Women were specifically targeted. And so I would just like to know some of the programs that the government or other organizations, um, programs that are in place to protect women. Can we, can we venture over this way <laughs> with the microphone? Is there a microphone? Hi there, thank you very much. My name is Todd Doe, I'm a South African studying in Canada. Um, I've been doing some work in my hometown in South Africa and one of the things that I've seen in South Africa is that there's a huge influx of people coming to do certain development work. And it's planting a seed in the people that that type of work is not stuff that the local people should be doing, but because there's this expectation that there's always people coming to build things and to, to do those build programs, it's planting a seed in the people that's, that's saying, no, this stuff is gonna get done. So I'm wondering what is being done in Mexico right now, we're sitting here with people coming up with projects and initiatives. What is being done to build capital within these places for people to say, no, this is something that we need to look into. We need to look at how do we alleviate poverty within the means that we have. That it shouldn't be something that has to come from across the border. Why, what's been done within, right, to try and build that capacity? Okay, I just want to get one more from the cheap seats in the back. Um, this, this gentleman's been raising his hand. Uh, right back. Um, my, my eleven, my twelve thirty. Uh, oh, okay. Thanks. Um, there was an article in the BBC just yesterday that that uh, posited a link that hasn't really been discussed between poverty in Mexico and poverty in the United States. Um, the fact of the matter is, uh, the availability of cheap labor um, done under minimum wage by illegal immigrants um, is not only exploitative and bad for the immigrants, it's bad for people that are actually competing for these jobs in America, um, the, the drug addicts, the, the people that have been stigmatized, uh, the, the mentally ill, the people that have left prisons. Um, to what extent do you believe that um, there should be a political push for the greater availability of work visas, greater availability of uh, paths to citizenship that will be mutually beneficial um, to restore the uh, to restore um, the ability to become a, a United States citizen um, and to restore the number of visas being offered um, uh, that has been lowered um, post recession, but when it should actually have been raised um, uh, stemming from the recession in order to address poverty. Um, in Mexico as well as the United States. Great, we're gonna have really quick responses from the panel. We've touched on security, uh, violence against women, social capital, building social capital uh, along the border, and uh, the issue of equity, exploitation, and immigration uh, policy reform. And we've got three seconds. So uh, <laughs> go ahead. Uh, if, if each of you would take on whatever piece of the, 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 those various puzzles that you'd like to talk about, we'll do one more quick round from each of you and, and go to the break. I'd like to talk about social capital because our model, and those of you that speak Spanish, is through prom a model of promotoria. And so the idea that you work with people in a community, 
Our entire staff, with the exception of myself, are Mexican citizens. I'm an immigrant Mexican. And um, we work with the people where they are to define and, and determine their own best solutions. And so I think participatory planning, um, social development that is integrated, um, and uh, time, having the time to create the relationships and everything that create a, a strong community fabric. That would be. Ana Gabriel Perez. Um, one of the things that I think is really important right now, as in Valle San Pedro, that we're starting a city, is exactly that. You have to create within what you already have, with the realms. We're not looking for outside. We're looking for the sources that we already have within the people. One of them is we're creating what we call a productive community. Um, some of the houses that we have are, they can be turned into stores so that you can actually buy from your neighbor instead of having to go to Walmart or in our cases, Calimax or our bigger stores. So we're trying to create this system where we're, even our, our science and everything says, a city that employs you when you employ your neighbor. So we're trying to get that system that whatever little money they have left after they pay their mortgage and their light, they can actually do something with it in their own neighborhood. Most of our, our innovative ideas that we're trying to create is trying to get everything within their limits, trying to get their money to be worth more. Even if it's from the maquiladoras, which we know most of them are working, well, how do we get them to get an effective transportation so that they don't spend that much time traveling? Because sometimes it could take us up to two hours. And a mother with a children, she needs those two hours with her family. So all of those things are important, but they're within our reach within just the creative realm of it. Sometimes it's just because we never actually went to the transportation system and asked them to have a direct route from the work to their house. Or we didn't actually think about having the own people have a system where I need a carpenter. Why can I get my neighbor to do the carpeting? Or I need milk. Why can I buy it from, from my neighbor? And so the money stays within the community and that will help prosper it. So I think all of those they seem um, logical, but they're innovative right now because it hasn't been done and put together into a plan. So I think that's part of what we have to do, start thinking on, on ways to make more with what we already have. Great. Uh, Mayor Reyes, please. Well, that, I think uh, Juarez, before all this violence, was known for the violence for against women. And uh, we did a, a very big mistake in the, in the, in the 90s. Uh, you know, when a woman gets killed, or anybody, but in particular women, uh, the police first look at the husband, or look at the boyfriend, or look at the lover, or look at the uh, uh, jealous neighbor. Or it's, mo for the most part, a crime of passion. And uh, it's how you investigate and how you solve maybe 90% of the cases. Uh, in, in what is serial killings began and, and uh, it wasn't the lover, it wasn't the husband, it wasn't uh, the jealous neighbor, it, it was somebody else doing uh, uh, that type of killing and the government didn't know how to handle it. They, they didn't know how to investigate it, they didn't know how, uh, what to do and, and it, they took the, the tremendously wrong approach of saying, uh, uh, look at look at her, L look at the body, uh, look at how she was dressed, she was asking for it. Uh, that was uh, not what a government needs to do, and a government needs to investigate uh, those types of crime and, and, and catch the criminals and put them in jail. And so it took us, unfortunately, seven or eight years to uh, turn the system around and have an investigative system. And uh, uh, last big case we had a little girl who was eight years old, kidnapped, uh, found a week later uh, dead in, in a cement uh, can. Uh, and the police took prints from the car that left the can, uh, hairs, and found that that type of car was is a truck, it was a very uh, seldom seen truck. Uh, it was a burrito salesperson. Uh, it turned out it was 
uh, somebody who was caught, who was a, a, a criminal, a sex offender against minors from Denver uh, that was deported to Juarez. Uh, nobody told the Juarez authorities that he had been deported. Uh, he was deported with two other sex offenders, lived in a home, uh, kidnapped the girl, and, and killed her. But they were caught. Uh, it was investigated, and they knew who it was, and we had scientific evidence to prove who it was, and we've come a long way. We come a long way from not investigating, and 395 women died under the circumstances of the government not investigating, and, and that is awful. Uh, but now the government investigates, and, and that's no longer a problem in, in Juarez. We have one of the best CSI investigation teams. Uh, it was paid by the, the U.S. government. They, they, uh, they gave us three and a half million dollars to set up this, uh, this center because it was of such importance uh, uh, for, for everybody. So uh, uh, fortunately for us, that's one less problem. We, we still have a lot of problems in, in Juarez that we need to solve, uh, but that's, that's one uh, that we have solved. And, and, and one thing that I do want to say is that uh, the best thing is to learn from the success. And uh, we have learned so much from Colombia. Uh, I hope you become the mayor. I don't know, what city? Uh, it's, uh, uh, I hope you will become the mayor. Uh, and uh, I hope many of you become the mayors of your cities and the chiefs of police and, and the uh, congressmen. Uh, because being at a place like this, learning is what you have to do. And uh, I've been to Colombia three times uh, to learn from what they've, did, they've done and we were able to do many of the things that it took Colombia 15 years to learn, uh, we were able to do in a much shorter time. Uh, they haven't yet solved completely the problem in Colombia. Uh, we are far from solving the problem in Juarez or in Mexico, but learning from the successes is, uh, is very important. And the fact that the leaders uh, from all over the world that are here are learning from, from those successes from uh, this uh, excellent panel is, is, is something that needs to be congratulated and I congratulate you. We, great answers, great responses and, and great panel discussion.